So we're actually really thrilled to have you as the first person that we're speaking to because uh, a lot of your work is either directly or indirectly looking at the concept of story mm -hmm. or looking at stories, the practice of stories. Mm -hmm. And in your book, the, uh, I should, I've completely spaced the name, The World is Made of Stories, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The World is Made of Stories. After, at the very end of your first chapter, you pull on Thomas Berry. And of course, Thomas Berry, you know, famously kind of coined the idea of new story. And he was all about the importance of story and that, you know, we're kind of in trouble because we don't have a story. And he kind of like your work, he goes back to the Popol Reformation of 1100 and, you know, looks at the rise of the Western story, which becomes the global story, now sees that story in crisis and, uh, and really looks forward to the opportunity, you know, for a real true global story, you know, and drawing kind of on the cosmological level of the history of the universe, blah, blah, blah. You do something different. And I guess you've got the twinkle in your eye. So uh, you say, you quote him, you say, we are between stories, Thomas Berry. Mm -hmm. Then I can see the twinkle in your eye here. I don't know if it comes out in Kindle very well. And then you add a dot, 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 perhaps not a bad place to be. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about why it's not a bad thing to be in between stories? Mm. Mm. When I think about, uh, say, spiritual practice, something like Buddhism, uh, the spiritual path, I mean, one way to articulate that is that it basically involves two supplementary processes, deconstruction and reconstruction. So deconstruction of the sense of self, that's something that, help, that happens, say, primarily in meditation, right? If the sense of self is composed of mostly habitual ways of thinking and feeling and acting, including identification with certain stories about who we are, what the world is, what's important in the world, how to live in the world, that kind of thing. So we come to practice with a story or with a cluster of overlapping stories. And it's really important in our practice, therefore, to let those go. And that's really what... The meditation is about right when we're letting go of concepts it's not just concepts but concepts are function you know th they're all interconnected they're they're parts of stories uh, so the other side of that is the the reconstruction so it's not simply about uh, deconstructing for example the sense of separation but it's also reconstructing how we understand ourselves and where we are in the world so it's, it's a double process, and one doesn't work very well without the other in the sense that, as I say somewhere in the book, the, the, it's not about getting rid of stories altogether, although that's certainly one way to understand some of the stuff, especially in Zen, but it's rather much more important to understand how storying works, because the truth is we need a story. At the same time, we need a story where we're not sort of stuck in a way that this is the only way that we can see the world. So the point of being between stories is that ability to have a story, but also not be so completely identified with it that we think it's the only possible truth and it's the only way to live in the world. So uh, in, in, that sense, I, in that sense, I think it's always important to be between stories, which is another way of trying to articulate the same kind of thing. Now, I, I hope that makes some sense to you there. Pete, do you mind if I just do one follow-up and, and then I'll back off a little bit here? But, uh, I kind of had this idea like we'd start in the huge social and then bring it down, but uh, mm -hmm, yeah. it, it turns out the world uh, doesn't always go to my plans. I don't, I don't know if anyone else Well, actually, that. that's the other thing that I wouldn't <laughs> mind saying about sure. it. You know, the word, the operative word there is we, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we can understand we as a bunch of Zen students, which in a way is what I just did, but we can also understand we as our now global civilization, as our now global culture. And it's, I think it's pretty clear with it's overly clear 
with the ecological crisis, with the pandemic, with the kind of incompetent political systems and corrupt exploitive economic systems, it's, it's getting pretty clear and clearer that the, the stories that have been operative, that we've been living, that we've been taking for granted, those stories aren't functioning anymore. anymore. And so now we've got to let them go. And it's kind of exciting, actually, because I doubt we'll have a better opportunity than we have right now in terms of coming out of the pandemic t- to maybe come to a new story and, and, and on the basis of that new story, create or reform institutions that will provide a better story. So that was part that you did two thirds where I was hoping to go with that. And maybe just the last part that I was hoping just to kind of give us a foundation mm. that uh, in, in that same book, you play with the uh, mythological idea, it's turtles all the way down. And then you talk about it stories all the way down. Can you just flesh out a little bit, you know, both on the, on the collective and the global, you know, whatever level you like, as well as the personal level, what do you mean by it stories all the way down? Well, How do we understand who we are? How do we understand what the world is? And basically what it comes down to is stories, right? Uh, some of those stories we identify with as reality, and we don't realize that they're stories, right? Uh, some, some of the stories, you know, like fairy tales or something, maybe we see through them, Santa Claus... Uh, Easter Bunny, Tooth Fairy at a, at a certain point. But a lot of the stories are simply things that in the process of growing up, we identify with because the, all the people around us identify with them. And therefore, it's just how we understand what it means to be a person and what the world is really about. So the challenge, therefore, is to disidentify f- from those stories, especially destructive ones. I mean, for something like Buddhism, The central concept is dukkha, suffering in the broadest possible sense. And the fundamental issue is a lot of the stories that we identify with and take for granted, that we are living to some degree, they are stories that cause dukkha, either our own individual dukkha and or dukkha for lots of other people. And so one way to understand the challenge for us today is to transform our stories, right? I remember Joanna Macy talking about the eco sattva path. She distinguished three aspects, right? One is defending what's left. Number two, creating the new structures, the new institutions, a bit like the old wobblies, creating the new in the shell of the old. But thirdly, in effect, we need new stories, new understandings of who we are, what the world is, what's possible. And we need all three of those today, very clearly. And in a way, you know, without the third, the other two just won't work because we're going to fall back into the same problems. At, at times like this, you know, where things really do seem to be breaking down uh, and there are new possibilities unfolding, it can work either way. I'm thinking about another Canadian, uh, Naomi Klein, mm-hmm. in her book, The Shock Doctrine, pointing out that, of course, uh, you know, uh, some pretty conservative and powerful capitalists can take advantage of situations like this to increase their power. So there are openings. And as you say, you might have opportunities for people promoting wind power and solar power, but you'll also have other people you know, trying to take advantage. One thing that's was stunning for me in your work, and I, I think I can say that without too much exaggeration, is how you use the, um, um, the three poisons in Buddhism to make institutional analysis. That the greed, anger, and ignorance, which I believe you translate as greed, ill will, and delusion, right? Mm-hmm. Could you tell right. us a little bit about uh, how you use those concepts to make a, a wider um, social analysis? Mm. Well, the way that the Buddha talked about them, or at least the way that he's been understood to talk about them. And I have to make that distinction because when you go back to the earliest text, when I read them, it suggests to me that the Buddha, Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, who lived in India maybe 2,400 years ago, 
I get the sense he was a lot more progressive than the institution that developed <laughs> after he died. Okay? And this is kind of typical of religious institutions, isn't it? But if you look at his attitude toward women, he created the Bhikkhuni Sangha for nuns. His attitude toward caste, the way that when you joined uh, the order, you lost caste. I mean, he, he, he saw something more, but then the way the institution developed, they tended to understand it. Buddhism tended to understand our own dukkha suffering in the broad sense as due solely to our own minds and our own karma, our own actions and past. So, Buddha and Buddhism doesn't talk about good versus evil in the Abrahamic sense. Rather, what it does is the Buddha says basically, if what you do is motivated by greed, ill will, or delusion, it's going to create problems. Right? But again, it was traditionally has been understood very much on the individual level. And fortunately, because Buddhism from the very beginning emphasizes impermanence and insubstantiality and is itself a good example of that, given the way that it's spread, you know, from India to Southeast Asia to East Asia to Central Asia and now to the West. Uh, Buddhism has the potential to develop in response to new situations and coming now, not just to the modern West, but sort of modernity or postmodernity are now global civilization. I think it's very clear one of the challenges is that we have to ask ourselves, Given what we know now about the way institutions work, how they can cause suffering, what, uh, what, how do we need to re-understand those fundamental Buddhist principles? So very briefly, I think our economic system is really institutionalized greed. If you understand greed in the sense of you never have enough, well, that certainly applies to a lot of consumerism. But even more so, if you think about corporations, how they're never profitable enough, their market share is never big enough, their stock price is never big enough, national GDP, GNP is never big enough, you know, why is war more and more always better if it can never be enough? It's this preoccupation with growth, which seems, which is now, it's pretty crazy, given that, you know, we're on a planet whose biosphere is not growing. And I think a lot of the ecological crisis can be understood as the kind of clash between an economic system that has to keep growing if it's not going to collapse, and basically a biosphere that can't essentially grow. I think that's the situation that we find ourselves in now. So institutionalized greed, our economic system, institutionalized ill will. Well, as a citizen of the United States, I don't have to look very hard. Uh, I mean, we could look at things like uh, our attitude toward refugees and so forth, migrants, but most fundamentally, our militarism. I mean, if you measure our military by the amount of resources we put into it, you know, this country is by far the most militarized in, in, in world history. And sadly, if you spend that much money on your military, you're going to have to find an enemy. You're going to have to fight a war once in a while, you know, to justify that. And it seems to me that's the kind of trap we're into. You know, we, we create enemies in, in various ways. And in a way, the whole military industrial system seems to need them. And then finally, delusion. Recently, you know, we're hearing a lot about fake news. And certainly there's plenty of that. But even prior to that term, if you look at the fact, say in the U.S., how um, most of the media are corporations, in fact, mega corporations, right? Corporations, they exist not to educate or inform us, but to make money. And how do they make money? They find ways to grab our eyeballs and sell them to the highest bidder. So they reinforce consumerism. They, they'll reinforce certain habits that will make people want to watch them. It's, you know, so obviously they're going to underplay a lot of the problems, especially the ecological ones that tend to depress us when, when we uh, realize them. So in that regard, uh, I think we can understand the three poisons or the three fires that the Buddha talked about as uh, principles, fundamental problems that I think we now need to understand much more broadly than in his day. And that means we have to also find ways to address them.
not not just look to our own minds and how they work to resolve our own dukkha, but to look at the way that uh, the dukkha is functioning institutionally. I mean, one thing I like to say is I think socially engaged Buddhism in the U.S., uh, when it comes to individual service, maybe helping homeless people or hospice work or prison dharma, I think we've become a lot better over the last generation. We've become a lot better pulling drowning people out of the river. But we're still not much better in asking, why is it that there are so many more people drowning in the river these days? You bring out it in some point in some book that you think that Buddhism and engage Buddhism in looking at whatever these you know, giant movements which are starting to happen at local and global levels interconnected, that uh, you think maybe that's a contribution that Buddhism can bring, its ability to maybe go a little bit more to the source. I don't know if you, maybe you could uh, elaborate that slightly. Well, Paul Hawken you know, has this wonderful book, Blessed Unrest, where he points out that something is happening now that's never happened before, that we have millions, I think, now he would say, well, over two million groups, you know, it's like springing up, nonprofit groups, springing up to work for social justice and healing of the earth. And he, what's fascinating about that, he has a whole chapter talking about looking at this as the immune system of the earth that has sprung up to work to heal itself. And, and I love that analogy. I think he's right. And, you know, when I look at socially engaged Buddhism, it's not as though we, that needs to be an independent movement. I see that as a very small part of that larger process. So what's distinctive about socially engaged Buddhism? And frankly, I think if, if we understand it properly, it's what's been called the Bodhisattva path. What's special about the Bodhisattva path is that it unites two practices. On the one hand, bodhisattvas continue to work on their own personal individual transformation, right? Meditation and so forth, their own insight, their own awakening. At the same time, they know that that's not sufficient. They know that it's important to get out there and become involved in the work. One problem with Buddhism still is that many people tend to think of real Buddhist practice as what's going on when we're meditating, maybe facing a wall, and seeing maybe engagement in the world as a kind of distraction from that. And I think what we're beginning to see and realize and incorporate into how we practice is that both, both are essential. Uh, and of course, in that way, we're also addressing not only our own individual greed, it will delusion, but doing what we can to address the, the institutionalized versions. And in a way, this makes sense, too, because just thinking about my own experience in the Maui Zendo when I first started, we were sitting really hard. Insights, openings, they weren't that difficult. Much more challenging was integrating what we saw, what we were beginning to realize, into how we actually related to other people in the world. How do you do that? How do we transform our habits so that we're not so self-preoccupied? Because Buddhist practitioners, that can just be another version of self-preoccupation, you know. How do we transform our habits so that they're more genuinely engaged and disconnected from the delusion of a separate self? We get out there and we engage in the world. That, that's how we do it. So I think... What's distinctive about Buddhist social engagement is we emphasize the importance of a double practice. I spent a lot of my time talking to Buddhists about you know, why it's important for their own practice to be engaged. It also works the other way around. I'm, I'm a member of local XR, Extinction Rebellion groups, here in Colorado. And it's very interesting. Uh, I was asked last year, would I actually offer a retreat? up at the Eco Dharma Center for Extinction Rebellion activists. And it was wonderful because they realized how important it is to ground their activism in some kind of contemplative tradition that can help them from getting burned out and angry and frustrated and, and so forth. So putting those two together is, is, I think, really what we need today. You know, how do you take the tools that exist and build new stories, build new practices out of the tools that already exist? 
Great question. And unfortunately, I don't think Buddhism has the answer to that. Um, All right. Well, it's been nice talk, talk and chatting with you. And uh, <laughs> we thought you had some answers. You got so many books. but uh. <laughs> I mean, I think Buddhism has a lot to say. But basically what it comes down to, it's, it's a lot about how to do what you do rather than what to do. And it makes sense. Look, I mean, the Buddha lived... Iron Age India, 2,400 years ago, right? I mean, he didn't have a climate emergency. He didn't have the kind of sixth grade extinction event or capitalism or nuclear weapons or plastic. I mean, it's just those were not his problems. And so we shouldn't be surprised that Buddhism doesn't really give us specific answers. The point of the Bodhisattva path, though, is I think it has a great deal to say uh, in, in terms of whatever we decide to do, how to do it, right? I mean, here in Boulder, for example, um, one of my good friends is a retired banker who has uh, a, a, he's himself a Zen teacher, but he also has the very special ability from his background to talk to Republicans. So he goes to Congress and he lobbies for a carbon tax, in effect. Wow. I have another good friend here who is very good at helping us reduce our individual carbon footprint. He helped my wife and I get an energy audit in our house when we bought this one, right? Um, I have a background as kind of an activist. I was a draft resistor during the Vietnam War era, and so I believe in nonviolent resistance. And so I've gravitated to things like, uh, like Extinction Rebellion. Now, which of those is a Buddhist? I mean, in a way, they all are. I mean, the important thing, and, and probably there's lots more that are needed as well. Those are just three examples. What I think the Bodhisattva path has to offer is, first of all, what I already said, that we need to bring together our individual practice with our engagement. Because the individual practice gives us the kind of equanimity or, or grounding that I think we need to engage in some very, very difficult work, which is often frustrating, right? And there are certain things that are built into that bodhisattva path in terms of, for example, of avoiding the kind of dualism where we get the idea somehow we're the good guys and they're the evil ones, and the point is to destroy them, right? Uh, the Bodhisattva path, you know, that's a kind of Abrahamic duality, as I said earlier. The Buddhism doesn't see the world in terms of good and evil. It sees it in terms of, well, lots of delusion, webs of delusion that we're all tending to have a place in. So when you, when you keep that in mind, it does make a difference in terms of how you relate to people. Sometimes you simply have to stop them what they're doing. But, but it's not about insulting them or, I mean, I'm really reminded and inspired by Gandhi, right? I mean, Gandhi, when you looked at how we related to the English, he never despised them. You know, he, he was educated in England. He, he had a lot of respect for the British and he knew that there were so few of them and so many Indians that at a certain point they were going to have to leave India and they did. So, I think that's the kind of attitude. That's not to say that we don't need sometimes to do some very strong nonviolent things, right? Um, I do have a whole kind of another direction to ask David, but Pete, I want to put you a little on the spot. That okay. uh, when I first reconnected with Pete about five years ago, we were in the Henry Mountains in Utah, the, uh, I'm told, the last mountains to be put on a map in the United States, and we're looking off at the horizon, and Pete still looked like he woke up from a dream. And, and you were telling me, Pete, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm setting you up a little bit here, that from about the age of 13 until like 40, your goal was a gold medal. And like, that's what drove you. And whether it was your personal work, you know, your personal skiing or your work as, you know, the head coach of the U.S. cross-country ski team, you know, that you were driven by uh -oh. that. You just froze again. Oh, can you hear us? Oh. Yeah, my favorite oh. singer, songwriter. Oh, is he back? I think you were starting to tell me, Andreas, about Peter's Lack Project. I, 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 <laughs> which is kind of where we're going. Thank you. But so here's the thing. So uh, 
were sitting up in the mountains and Pete looked like, uh, one, someone told me they met Ozzy Osbourne once and he looked like he'd just woken up from a dream and he couldn't believe he was like eating, you know, chicken's heads or whatever. Like he just looked really <laughs> dazed. And uh, Pete kind of looked like that. He's like, what have I been doing? I've spent my entire life trying to ski fast. What a complete waste of time. And don't even get me started about the Olympics. The Olympics is just a big land grab. And so he was like <laughs> way over here and just saying competition is the poison. It is the waste of time. And so th th that was Pete about five years ago. And then we, uh, we were together about two years ago and had really kind of done this cool double movement. And so this is all the setup, Pete, the colorful setup. But what are you thinking of? Uh, you've, kind of you've made a new story about competition that you really have to write your book on. So tell us about Competere. Tell us. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I really swung. Like, I don't think that's, that's pretty much my whole life. Very much going after things one way. And uh, so I really swung. I was anti-Olympics, anti-competition, anti-sport in general. And actually, and especially that, that especially happened as my kids were quite young and, and uh, I saw all the, the evil of that path. And so I went in that direction. We're not doing any of that. <clears throat> but then I really started to come back. And as, especially as my kids actually started to participate in skiing, just, just going skiing. And I started to see the benefits of just the sport itself. And then I started to see some of the actual benefits of competition and what I got out of that, you know, just going skiing is, is unquestionably awesome. I mean, you get so much health and it's great for your mind and so on and so forth, but where does competition come in? And then I started to see, well, I wouldn't really have been involved at a, at a level that, um, uh, uh, that I could really learn something from it without competition. And so then I started to come back and, and what Andreas is talking about is kind of the root of the word competition is competere, which, and you know, this is just stuff I read. I'm not a, a real scholar. So um, is the root of this word means to seek together. And so I started to really look at competition as a way that by trying your hardest, hmm. by doing your best, even if you have set this goal to win, but by trying to do your best and to go your hardest, that is actually exactly what the other people need you to do. So by trying your best, you bring everybody up. And, you know, there's the, the way that competition is done, which is to try to win by beating everybody down, by beating other people. But this way of competition is really raises everybody up. And um, that shift in perspective was huge for me. And, yeah, I think that's where Andreas was pointing me. Well, you know, you, you, uh, you blew my mind, Pete, when, when you're talking about that, because I said, you know, why not just go for a run? And he said, well, then you're yeah. just the guy running in the woods. <laughs> right. And uh, doesn't and, help anybody else. Yeah. And, and I would never have considered that of competition as community building, competition as relationship building. And right. that you, you gave the example too of boxers, that from right. your perspective, the idea is not to like knock the other guy out. The idea is two people who are pushing each other to be better and better together mm -hmm. and that you need right. each other. You need relationships in order to uh, build yourself. Right. And, uh, so what do you think, David? Should he write the book? Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. I, I think I it's going to be called Especially just given your background, I think you, you have a special perspective here that's going to be very important. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it reminds me of a lot of other things where, say, say even in Buddhism, there's the idea somehow that, you know, something is bad and it's not it's not bad in itself. It's a certain type of, of I, clinging and grasping mm. that distorts it, that, that becomes problematical. And often that has to do with, with means and ends that one is only competing to get to the end point, right? It's like, right. It, who, who, was, who was the football coach who said, you know, uh, winning isn't just the most important thing. It's the only thing. Right. So he's missing, you know, right. it's like the Olympics. It's like, that's yeah. ego. Right. There's right. no question. That's ego. Right. I'm better than you. Right. 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 And, and you're talking about something else, something very beautiful. Now I, I'm not a skier, but I'm a chess player. And when wow. I was young, I actually played competitively. I used to play yeah. in tournaments. Right. 
And it's very interesting. Chess is a perfect example because if, if the opponent isn't very good and you win easily, what's the point? Right. It's not very interesting. The, right. the best games are the games where the two people are pretty evenly matched and then something really creative evolves out of that. Yeah. And, and I think that's exactly the point that, that you're making here. So, yeah. you know, the, within the chess world, there are a lot of really famous games and they're never one-sided games. They're right. games where that's exactly what's happened. That right. one guy, the game is so wonderful because that was the only way the guy could win. Exactly. So I think that's a really, yeah. a really uh, I- important point. Yeah. Just skiing. Global ecological collapse. No, global capitalism, ecological collapse, and personal happiness. <laughs> what, do, 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 what do you think about the title? You got to tag that on the end for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but what I've really enjoyed about discovering your work is your use of emptiness, or what you call lack, mm. to really make a profound social analysis. Now, in uh, you've been trying to get out of our conversation for a while now, so I won't make you do mm-hmm. you know, repeat your whole book. No, but I'm uh, but um, that uh, if, if you could just tell us a little bit about. Um, your idea of lack and lack projects, and then also your analysis of lack and the history of modernity, which is now globalization. That uh, it's just it's a, it's a, such a, a different way to understand history, hmm. Hmm. and it's also a different way of understanding what Buddhism calls dukkha, hmm. right? The word usually translated as suffering. But, you know, that only makes sense if we understand it in the broadest possible sense, uh, including what discomfort, dissatisfaction, dis-ease, anxiety, that, that. So, um, yeah, th- the basic idea there is, is, I think, pretty simple, that the Buddhist point about the emptiness of the self in more contemporary language, what that really involves is we, you know, and, and we see this happen. You're seeing this happen, Peter, with your four- and eight-year-old, how as they grow, you know, when they're born, the infant, the, the newborn doesn't have a sense of self. It's something that develops. It's a, it, it has to do with social construction. It's, it has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with learning how to use language. And also, children learn to see themselves in the way that other people see them. It's mm. part of this acculturation, right? Ah. But what this means fundamentally then is that the sense of self, especially emphasizing the sense of separation, by which I mean the feeling that there's a me inside and you and the rest of the world are outside, that sense of separation, it's, it's not real. It, the sense of self is a construct composed of mostly habitual ways of thinking and feeling and acting. And what that means is fundamentally then, because it doesn't have any reality of its own, our sense of self is inherently uncomfortable. Uh, And I think the way that we usually experience and understand this discomfort is as a sense of lack, by which I mean the feeling that there's something wrong with me. Something is missing. Uh, I'm not quite right. I'm not good enough. Maybe that's right. And of course I can become better by becoming the best skier and winning and winning the race. Right. So obviously this is a, 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 um, something that encourages that kind of competition. Right. Right. What I find interesting about this is I think this is one of the great kind of open secrets in the sense that as far as I can see, we all have this sense of lack but we don't always realize that everyone else does it. We think it's our own personal problem. And, you know, we have this sense of, oh my God, it's what, what's wrong with me. And when we can realize that it's something that everyone has, there's something very liberating and very important. But the important point is how, depending on the kind of society we're in, maybe depending on our particular family conditioning, how we understand our sense of lack will vary a lot. So for example, growing up in 20th or 21st century United States, 
what do we lack? Well, one of the big things that happens is we lack enough money, right? We're not rich enough or we don't have enough consumer toys. Or given the power of social media and Facebook and the internet and all the possibilities there, we're not famous enough, right? Uh, my, I'm not getting enough clicks on my uh, Facebook accounts and so forth. I mean, and, and there's a number of other things, but what this leads to then is, is what I call lack projects or sometimes maybe reality projects. Because another way to say the same thing is that we don't feel real enough. And if I can just get enough money or enough consumer toys or whatever, whatever it is out there that I think I'm lacking, if I can just get enough of that, then I'll feel okay, then I'll feel real. Then this hole, this festering hole at the core of my being will be filled up, as it were. And tragically, of course, all that way of thinking, the problem is that there's something out there that I don't have. All that is really just a symptom of the fundamental problem which is that there's some delusion of, of separate self. The other interesting thing that when, when you understand the sense of self and dukkha in that way, then you look around at society and you see it's not just an individual problem, but society is structured in a way that builds on that. Uh, uh, well, first of all, you look at something like advertising. How does that work? Right, we've got to keep the economic system growing. So you, the whole point of advertising is teaching us what it, what it is that we lack. That particular product, right? If you want to be happy, buy me, kind of thing. We can we understand that, but we can also see it, I think, more deeply in terms of the way that institutions uh, work, because they they also institutionalize lack. Uh, say a corporation. As I said earlier, it's, it's never big enough, profitable enough. Uh, its market share is never big enough. So institutions, right. too, they can kind of institutionalize the sense of lack. And, and the point of institutionalization is that it kind of takes on a life of its own, apart from the motivations of the individual people involved. If they're not serving the institution, they're spit out and replaced by somebody else who will continue to play that game of increased profitability and, uh, and growth and so forth. So, I mean, I think the, the sense of lack is also, it's important in terms of a way to understand fundamental Buddhist points in the contemporary world about suffering and so forth. But also, it's extremely valuable if we want to look at uh, the way society is functions. There's a kind of social analysis kind of built into that. We can use it as a way to see where our society is stuck. I appreciate you how you keep on bringing out about capitalism. It makes me think that uh, the very DNA of capitalism is endless accumulation, that yeah. it can't exist without that. So it's not only, oh, we just need a bit more, but the whole system is based on, on endless accumulation. Some people even say that the birth of capitalism was the birth of a culture of endless accumulation that you don't want to just like get your load of booty, you know, taking your spice run and sit back as a landed gentry. But now you're just going to keep on always accumulating and that set up the possibility of capital to uh, be a structuring principle. So another way to, sorry, go ahead. Oh, please, please. Another way, the same thing is to talk in terms of means and ends. Uh, I mean, the birth of capitalism is associated with a certain way of understanding land and people and, uh, say, uh, patri uh, patrimony. It's like seeing all of them as means, you know, people simply as, employer, as employees, uh, laborers, seeing land and resources to be exploited in a certain way, and also using using money to make more money. It's like, it, it's a very potent kind of mix. Polanyi talked about this, I think. And then once that starts, it, it just kind of takes on a life of its own and, and it never has enough. And the way it plugs into our individual psychology, I think is very important because, uh, you know, money, money isn't just uh, a means of exchange uh, 
or something that you can invest to make more money. But given the kind of society we have, it becomes a symbol. Really, psychologically, it symbolizes. I mean, most of us think that uh, if I just have everything I need, then I'm going to be happy, right? So money symbolizes the possibility of happiness. That, that's the irony of it all. Well, the real irony is the fact that um, the way the capitalist system works is that it has to keep, how, how, to, how to say it, the, the real irony is that money in and of itself is a nothing, right? It's a social agreement. The numbers in our bank accounts, the pieces of paper, they have no value except insofar as we have this legally enforced agreement. It's our means of exchange. And so the real irony is that the capitalist system at this point needs to grow, needs to keep exploiting the biosphere, the ecosystems, in order to maximize something that in and of itself has no reality whatsoever, money. I mean, there. I think there's a really powerful, profound kind of irony there when, once we really understand what's going on. Of course, then having the money, we can translate that to buy anything that we want, but that's the kind of trap that, that we seem to be caught up in. All of the resources, including labor, including uh, capital, whatever money is available, all of that is a means to the end of maximizing you know, profit, which is to say money, which in and of itself is nothing, has no meaning whatsoever, insofar as we can it's a very weird, weird kind of loop that we're all trapped in, I think. Yeah. Ski, ski racing fell apart for me the very first time that I had success, like real success. And I said, and I saw that immediately, I'm like, this will never end. This is going to feed into the next thing. And it's just going to keep going. There's no finish line here. But I, I still struggle to put a new story in place, even though I recognize that. And I recognize what you're saying with capitalism and money, and it's just going to keep going. But I, I, even recognizing that, I don't, I don't know how to put a new story into action. What do I, I replace <laughs> that old story with? I don't, I don't know that any of us do. Right. Well, really. yeah. um, I mean, cer certain things we can see, like, for example, if, um, if, if, say, capitalism as we now experience it is a form of institutionalized greed, I mean, I can think of others. What's the opposite of greed? Generosity. Well, I think one thing the pandemic is exposed, right? Unlike a number of other countries, the United States doesn't have a healthcare system. We have a healthcare industry. The whole point of an industry is to make money. The whole point of a system is to keep us healthy and to make us healthy. So one, off, one thing we obviously need, which would institutionalize generosity, is a national health care system. And hasn't that become obvious? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think it does. And uh, another thing that many people are talking about is a guaranteed national income. Now, that, that doesn't... That doesn't necessarily answer the question, do we need some kind of socialist way of organizing the economy, or is it more a matter of more, much more careful control? And because it's, in a way, the, the capitalist market, the strength of it is that it's an incredibly efficient way to mobilize and to, and to use certain types of resources. The problem is when it takes on a life of its own and subordinates the rest of society to it. Mm. So the challenge is using this economic system, the market, in a way that preserves something more important, which is to say people and, and society and the earth, you see. And again, I don't think Buddhism obviously doesn't have any simple answer to that, but there are certain basic principles here that, you know, we, we can look to.
obviously, if our economic system is is motivated and our political system, if they're motivated by greed, ill will, and delusion, there's going to be suffering. But you know, how how do we institu- institutionalize generosity? Uh, mm-hmm. Can you tell us, can you tell Pete, can you tell myself, how do you become an ecosatva? We want to know. What, what, what are the ingredients to becoming an ecosatva? Now, we want to make a new story. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's pretty basic. Uh, we've already touched on that to a large degree. It's, it's basically the bodhisattva path in a particular direction, right? So on the one hand, I think it's really important that one have some kind of contemplative practice. And I'm not saying it has to be Buddhism, but some, the recognition that it's not going to be adequate to simply try to transform society with also, without also transforming ourselves, because those two things are so interwoven. And, you know, we have plenty of examples historically about how, you know, revolutionaries overthrow and what happens is one gang of thugs are replaced by another gang of thugs. So if you don't work on yourself as well, if you don't understand your own ego as, 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 as a potential problem and the ways that the ego is going to want to exploit the new situation, then probably things are going to be just as bad or worse as, than they would before, right? So that's an essential part of it, right? The, the other part of it, of course, is the, the connection with the earth. And, and here there's, there's, there's two things that I would emphasize. Um, I think almost all of us are starved by a sense of alienation or disconnection from the natural world, right? So we started this Ecodharma Center in the mountains above Boulder. And when we have retreats, we're spending basically all of our time outside. And we, you know, people go off by themselves. They, they connect with the trees. They connect with the wildflowers. They connect with the stream. They connect, they connect with the meadows. We, we really need to feel that and to feel the gratitude for that because I think that grounding is absolutely necessary if we're going to deal with the kind of grief and the kinds of challenges that we face. And here I'm following on from Joanna Macy, whose work has been, it it really seems to me she's the most important teacher of our era. And what her work that Reconnects does, you know, you, you you emphasize gratitude for the natural world, which for me, you know, it means you get out into the natural world and, and it's not just some abstract thing, but you're, you're there and on being grounded in that gratitude then helps us re- really address and be able to cope with the very difficult kind of ecological situation that we're in at its best the practice helps us open up to our own rootedness or groundedness in the earth there's a fascinating story in the Pali canon that right after his awakening, the Buddha was challenged by Mara, right? This, this principle of this demon, as it were, who basically said, you know, you think you're awakened. What? Maybe you're just kidding yourself. Who, who verifies, who authorizes your awakening? And the Buddha, very interestingly, he touched the earth. And he said, the earth is my witness. Wow. What does that really mean? You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of ways to understand that, but one of the stories, such as, uh, say, uh, Thomas Berry talks about, is just the, the realization that, you know, we're not a species that just happens to live on the earth, that we are one of the many ways that the earth is manifesting itself. And in particular, we seem to have this special attribute of a certain kind of self-conscious self-awareness. Can we be the way that the earth wakes up? In a way, we, we, we still have this fundamental duality or delusion that we're separate from the earth. What happens when we realize, no, we are the earth, that what we're doing is the earth is calling upon us, acting through us to, to defend itself, uh, that, that we're part of the immune system of the earth, that we can become part of the immune system of the earth working, working for its healing. 
So to become an ecosatva, I think, is ideally for those of us who have the opportunities to engage and immerse ourselves in the natural world and open up to that. It's to get in touch with what does the earth want us to do? I mean, to me, I think there's, the, I mean, one way to understand it is these, these three steps. We have to look at ourselves, look at our own situation, my age, uh, my health, my education, my skills, where am I, what are my networks, and so forth. That's the first thing. The second thing is my larger location. What are the issues here that I can address? Um, and what are the potentials within the situation? But I think maybe the most fundamental one that is most empowering is maybe something, and it's not an ego decision. It's, it's, not, it's rather a kind of slow, reflective opening up. What is it that pulls at my heart? You know, there are so many problems. There are so many issues, so many ways we can go. And, you know, we can't do everything. We'll just spread ourselves so thin it won't have any impact whatsoever. It's really important that we focus ourselves. But where? Again, as I said, well, what do I have to offer? What's the situation? And even the most important thing, where does my heart where does my heart, what, what tugs at me? I think that's what we, we need to, and again, our practice can help us be more sensitive, more aware of this sort of gentle flowering forth. Yeah. Well, I'm a little dense, but I saw Pete had an awakening experience right when you're talking about uh, the Buddha touching the earth. <laughs> So uh, at least at least one of us got awakened today. That's 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 good. Well, uh, one of the I think we something I wanted to say a long time ago, and it was about the Bodhisattva path and and what it gives us. And I think that is the awareness in our ability to use our attention to discover our community and to discover where our heart is really leading us. And so it's like a it's kind of like a two part thing. If you're paying attention. On one part of that is you can be aware of dangers and delusions. You you have the attention and the awareness to 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 guard against that. But you also, when you're aware, you're open and you you recognize beauty and you recognize what is making your heart pound. So on both in uh, being aware and having attention protects you, but it also opens you up to all the beauty that's out there. As long as we have this strong sense of separate self that I'm in here, you're out there, then our, our, our attention, it, it's very hard to avoid the kind of lack projects that I talked about, mm-hmm. right? This sense of self is inherently insecure, uncomfortable, mm-hmm. and it's always trying to secure itself. Mm-hmm. So that's why the, the, the contemplative is so important. That if, if we can somehow open up, then awareness becomes very different, you know. It's, 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 not that, it's not that consciousness is something that the self has. It's the opposite. It's like the self is, is a form that, that consciousness takes, you could say. And when we can open up and let go of that sense of separate self, then there there's there's something else calling there's something else speaking to us all the time and we've just been in our shell insulated from it and we're not we're not receptive yeah. i'm reminded of something meister eckhart said about grace he said god's grace is always always flowing it's all it's always flowing on us the question is are we open to it yeah you know it's it's the same kind of thing i think I'd, I'd, I'd kick myself if I didn't ask this kind of clarifying question that uh, on one hand, you know, like you already awakened Pete, I, I didn't get it, but uh, about we are the earth. About, we, sorry? That we are, uh, supposed to be very well placed, that we, uh, that we are the earth. <laughs> There's enlightenment and that the earth itself is a testament to his awakening. And then on the other hand, that there's this language, and I imagine that language is what's tripping me up more than anything else. Mm-hmm. But maybe you could uh, help steer me with some better language. That uh, 
in a lot of Buddhist uh, writings, you know, from Dogen, dropping away body and mind, or in the Vajrayana tradition of Rigpa, which is seen as something, you know, beyond body and mind. That, uh, how, how, do you, how, do you pl- how do you work with those dimensions? Like, can you, can you bring those together for me? That uh, how, in, how in one sense is the Buddhist path dropping away body and mind, and at the very same time, being part of the earth? Well, to, to continue that story, right? Uh, bo- I, should always, I should always keep on reading. I should have just kept on reading. I would have saved, uh, would have saved you the trouble. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Because after Dogen had his experience, he went to see his teacher, and, and he, you know, he talked about you know, body and mind have dropped away. So what's after that? Mm. It is... Dropped away body and mind. <laughs> it, it's, a different way, it's a different way of experiencing your body, and it's a different way of experiencing your mind if you want to divide it up into those bits, yeah. right? So it's not about transcending, and, and this is where religions, including some types of Buddhism, get trapped, right? It's about transcending, going somewhere else, some other dimension, some other reality. No, it's about a transformed way. Of, of experiencing your sense of self, a transformed way of experiencing your body and the transformed way of relating to other people and, and to the earth. And the main point of that transformation is overcoming the sense of separation because that that's, that's seems to be really at, at the heart of the problem. And, and, and that's not to say that you aren't you and I am I. I mean, there's that dimension too. But nonetheless, what it means for you to be you and what it means for me to be me, there, there's a kind of interdependence and interconnection mm-hmm. and, and relationship. So, you know, there's, there's the two sides to it. Pete, can you take our, give us the last question? Wow, the last question. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> Even for a podcast, that sounds pretty extreme. <laughs> my I, last question is the same as my first question was, which is, you know, living, living it. And my question, my question for me, like every day is, how do I raise my girls? And um, we were talking about habits. How do we develop? No, it's not. Oh, man. This is too much pressure, Andreas. It's not about <laughs> how do we not develop the wrong habits, but how, you know, of thought. How do I help them? How do I raise these kids, man? That's my only question. <laughs> that's it. Well, so maybe that's not the right final question. That's just my question. Well, there, actually, there's a question I'll ask myself maybe to end, but, but I, I do want to <laughs> say something about that. Yeah. I mean, there is, I don't know if you call it a paradox, but you need a sense of self, mm-hmm. right? And it's like to, it's to function in the world. We, we need, it's like we have to be able, let me say it this way, right? Okay, where we usually start is we, we find ourselves in a, in a conditioned, constructed world that we take for reality, and it's a dualistic world. Things are separate. You're separate from me. My well-being is separate from you, and so forth, right? And it's really important in, through the practice. It's not about transcending the world in the sense of another reality, but it's simply becoming aware that there's another way of experiencing the world. There's another way of experiencing you, another way for me to experience myself, and the practice opens us up to that. That's not to deny this other dimension where you are separate from me. And so it's not a matter of rejecting one for the sake of the other, but somehow integrating the two. Mm-hmm. Now, in, in relationship to raising children and and more, I think more generally, relating to people, I, I hesitate to say it because it's so, let me say it indirectly, mm-hmm. Nisargadatta, this wonderful quotation that I like to use, I don't know if I mentioned it already earlier today or not, 
But Nisargadatta famously said, when I look inside and see that I am nothing, that's wisdom. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that's love. Oh. Wow. The yeah. two pillars of the Buddhist path, wisdom and love, or wisdom and compassion, right? Mm -hmm. Now, love is not a feeling. Love is not, love is a way of being in the world that integrates that insight that we're not separate, that, it, that by myself, that there's no self separate, right? Really. Mm -hmm. How do I integrate that? Hmm? Fundamentally, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it sounds so blasé. It's unconditional love. Oh my God, unconditional yeah. love yeah. for everything. And that's the sacred, yeah. you know, how do we desecrate? Mm -hmm. You know, if you give your kids and your partner and whatever, whatever, you know, this constant message, not, not by saying it so much, but just in terms of how you relate to them, this constant, they know that you love them unconditionally. That is, I think, the most powerful thing any of us, any of us can do. Mm. Sometimes I'd like to talk about this in terms of, by, in terms of asking, um, who is the most loved person in the history of the Western tradition? Karl Marx. <laughs> no. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> the other. I didn't know there could be a wrong answer, but that was the wrong one. <laughs> I got that one. <laughs> Socrates. <laughs> nope. Jesus. Yes. <laughs> Jesus and or Mary. Uh, they are the most loved people. In the whole, and why? Because they are the ones with the most love. They are the archetypes, regardless of what they may have been. They are historically, they have become the mythological archetypes of unconditioned love. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are challenged to embody in mm -hmm. how we relate to other people and, and, and to the earth, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if there's another answer, Andreas, that's going to satisfy any question better than that. I'm fascinated by evolutionary psychology. And this is the missing link in something that I've been working on for a very long time. You know, the Buddha never said our nature is bas basically good. There are some Buddhist groups that will say that. The Buddha never said that. What he said is we have some tendencies, greed, ill will, delusion, that are problematical, and others are very positive. And the path is about minimizing, the, eliminating the negative and developing the positive, right? Well, when we look at evolutionary psychology, I, need, I think we need to accept that there are some problematic tendencies very deeply built into us, probably genetically, right? Tendencies to exploit, uh, b because they helped get your genes into the next generation, which is the only thing that evolution really cares about, you know, in terms of what genes survive. Um, I think it was Immanuel Kant who said, of the crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight can be made. I don't know about the straight part, but the crookedness is that because of individual selection, we have some pretty selfish and self-regarding tendencies built into us. <laughs> and because of group selection, we have some wonderful positive ones as well. Mm. We have both. Mm. We have both. There, there's a Buddhist writer uh, who, who wrote a very interesting book. Uh, you are not your fault. And that is an absolutely wonderful title, right? When you were born, no one asked you, which, qual which traits do you want to have? They're just, they're just what we are, right? What, what if accepting that you are not your fault, Trump is not his fault? I mean, you know, what a pitiful human being in so many ways. And yet you can see it as a result. He obviously had a pretty horrible family situation, right? So what if we forgave everybody for everything? And you can see how that ties in with the unconditional love. 
that doesn't mean it's like it doesn't mean we're not responsible but it's not about guilt it's not about i'm no good we still have to take responsibilities for whatever tendencies we have and try to like the buddha said minimize the one develop the other but it's it's what evolution gave us to to work with and it, it, it's by no means certain that it's workable. Mm-hmm. E.O. Wilson, the Harvard biologist, said, our basic problem is we have paleolithic emotions, mm-hmm. medieval institutions, <laughs> and godlike technology. <laughs> and he's on to something. You know, paleolithic emotions are drives that were built into us by the evolutionary process and that we haven't always done a very good job dealing with. And now we have godlike technologies that can destroy the earth. Mm. And, you know, if you had to put a bet on what's likely to happen, mm. you know, except there's no one around to collect, <laughs> right? Or it's kind I of mean, it, it's like, okay, it, except that in a way we're a kind of experiment to the earth You know, in a way, we've also been dealt a bad hand just by the way evolution works. Mm -hmm. Okay, we accept it. And do you see what I'm pointing to here? A kind of radical acceptance, Uh, even of how things can go horribly long and not feeling guilty. We'll do what we can. We don't know what's going to come out of that. But that's okay. Maybe it's our destiny to have had this wonderful Mm -hmm. era in the sun for a while. and. What I think is wonderful is that the Axial Age religions, like Christianity and Buddhism, show us a way out. They really show us the way out, but historically, they were almost immediately co-opted by the forces that Mm -hmm. they were trying to... It's like, you know, Christianity, or what Jesus taught, was immediately became institutionalized as the Roman Catholic Church in the Roman Empire, for God's sake. Or, you know, you can see the same thing in Buddhism. So, historically, the Axial Age traditions got co-opted. Their radical message was not... But but the teachings survive, thanks to script. And so, we have these wonderful universalist teachings that, that kind of show us the way forward, show us how we can transform ourselves if we want to do that. What's the result of that going to be? Are enough people going to want to do it in enough time? It's not something to be terribly optimistic about. But hey, it's the only game in town. It's the only game in town. It's the only game I want to play. And it's a wonderful game to do what we can to work in that direction. I don't know if that makes any sense. Man, man, ah. Pete, um, this, is, this is off the record now, Pete. Um, a, couple, <laughs> a couple of years ago, we were drinking a lot of ayahuasca and in a small group, a little unstructured, and uh, Pete was lying there and he said, please carry me to the funeral pyre. I'm so tired of the self. Ah. And so we, we carried him. And, you know, and uh, he just seemed like he was like given something up there. But I know afterwards you're like, damn it, you know, like this is still bothering me. So I'm curious, yeah. Pete, like how, how is this conversation uh, and like your life in the last two years and maybe this conversation, how has that led to your kind of grappling with self? Um, I'm buoyed by ideas of forgiveness. And what David was just talking about really just makes my heart like fill um you know being able to forgive somebody like trump why is that that's um that's easier for me than than forgiving myself you know why is that and so but but whenever david's talking about like uh, in that sort of way it really just buoys me and feels so good that kind of forgiveness and that the self is it's not something to be destroyed it's some it has a great place and an important place and i just you know i have to find the i just have to find that and that there is the ability to even just to find that is enough (laughs) you know even if i i mean know that there's not going to be a i'm never going to come to a place of where i'm there but just to know that i can continue to work work there and and that 
the possibility, the possibility is, is fabulous. Mm. I, I don't know whether we ever get there. Right. In the, it's like, even with lack projects, is it the case that someone is deeply enlightened and then there's no more lack project? Or is it rather more, through the practice, it gives us a certain spaciousness so that, you know, the lack, yeah, it'd be great to be famous or, or whatever. You, you know, there's that thought and that, but be, there's a spaciousness in the sense that one isn't identifying and reacting to it. There, there's, there's an awareness of it. So it doesn't control what I do in the same way. So, you know, do we actually finally get rid of lack projects? I don't know. I certainly, I certainly haven't, but it's important that we can create, that we can develop in ways that we're not determined by them. They don't determine how we relate to each other and to the world. When I read, I think it was the first book I read of yours was it was your last book on ecology, and I, I believe I believe I read it there. And the and in one or two paragraphs, and somewhere you bring out lack projects, and I felt like my life was devastated. I suddenly saw my my whole history as a series of lack pro, you know projects, just like so so clearly, and uh, it, it was it was a, a difficult pill. Briefly, you know, I'm a child of the 60s, and it's very interesting uh, growing up with the Vietnam War, really, and, and realizing that our government lies to us. Well, back in those days, you know, as, a, as I was a Navy brat. My father was career military, so that's a pretty big realization. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the world is different than you thought it was. And then at the same time, uh, psychedelics. So I did my share of LSD and much later ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. That was more recent. But, uh, you know, psychedelics, you don't just feel different. The world is different. And you realize, whoa, I see the world in the way that I do because of the way my mind works. And if my mind is different, it's going to be a different world. <laughs> Big realization. <laughs> a lot of people get stuck there. Give me some more acid. Mm -hmm. But the reason why Buddhism, etc., exploded in the 70s was because of the psychedelic revolution in the 60s. People realized we needed this other way to pursue this insight, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I've been a draft resistor as well, so I dropped out. I was a hippie in Hawaii, and it was there that I eventually became involved in, in Zen practice. And then after that, went back to graduate school because I wanted to sort of look more and more at the history of the uh, Asian traditions, mm -hmm. what they had to say about what I was experiencing. I wanted to sort of use that. And so that was, that was the progression. And then I eventually ended up uh, the Zen master that I'd started to practice with in Hawaii, Rob uh, Yamada Cohen, he visited. Mm -hmm. Then I, uh, I really, felt very connected with him. So I ended up living in Japan 20 years and um, um, completing the koan, the curriculum of koan study with him. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and so I've been very lucky, right? I've been able to combine all this, right? Uh, my commitment to spiritual practice with my intellectual studies mm -hmm. and a little bit of active, well, more than a little bit of activism and mm -hmm. more than a little bit of psychedelics uh, along the way. You know, they all have been able to kind of work together. But I know that among Buddhist teachers, there's a lot of debate. You know, how useful are psychedelics once yeah. somebody has, you know, considers themselves on the Buddhist path and how useful is it not? And of course, some people, you know, say you're just splattering your mind against the wall and that, you know, other people like, like Jack Cornfield, I know he's like famous for, you know, saying this could be a very useful tool, you know, in mm -hmm. conjunction. So I'm curious, uh, as a child of the sixties and being on that first side of psychedelics, what do you think about the return of psychedelics in Buddhism? I think it's very exciting. Yeah. Um, you're right that it's very controversial in the Buddhist world. There's, there's a fascinating book uh, which debates that based on a tricycle article. What's the book called? Uh, anyway, it's, it, it goes into some detail on, and has arguments on both sides. Mm -hmm. You know, the basic problem is uh, I think a lot of the Buddhist traditions 
are pretty traditional. <laughs> you know, they're kind of fixed in their way. I mean, uh, look, I, I lived in Asia almost 30 years, and there's not any Buddhist, and I was all over, there's no Buddhist tradition there that I would want to import as is. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's valuable stuff there, but it's not just about appropriating what they've done. We've got to be creative. And, uh, you know, very few teachers have any experience of anything like psychedelics. I mean, it may have played a role at one time in Tibetan or something. I don't know, you know, in some of the tantric stuff, but basically they don't really. And, and so I think this is our, this is one of the important new developments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, wh when I talk to fellow Buddhist practitioners, including teachers, almost all of them have some psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. And, Certainly in my case, I think I was enough of a repressed, stuck up in my head intellectual that without something like that, I think it would have been really hard mm -hmm. to get into Buddhist practice. In fact, even then, I kind of got tricked into it. <laughs> my, my karma was to be tricked into it. And that was the only way it happened. So I think psychedelics... Is can be a really really important part of of the path, but of course it's tricky. I also have a friend that I was living with who had a very bad trip. It mm. it plugged into some deep psychological problems. He went home and he shot himself. He killed himself. You know, so we know we know things can go wrong. So it's no joke. Mm. And then there's all the legal repercussions as well. But I think more and more there's the realization that this can play an important role yeah i mean how it's going to play out now in the future i don't i don't know i mean i'm living in colorado marijuana is and also i i've just recently denver i think now uh, psilocybin is yeah. legal there yeah. which is quite attractive you know yeah, yeah so you know, and I think there's now this petition in Washington, right? Washington State, I keep getting these emails. Mm -hmm. They want to put that on the ballot oh, wow. to make psilocybin uh, legal yeah. in Washington. So, you know, there's definitely a movement, and I think it's very exciting. I have to say, I had more trouble with uh, ayahuasca. Mm. It's just so foul. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like my body was saying, you're not going to do that to us again, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So, and what kind of know. context were you drinking ayahuasca in? Uh, well, I, I, I was in Peru. Okay. And, and it's interesting talking about karma. Mm -hmm. I'd heard a lot about ayahuasca. I wanted to do ayahuasca. I was curious. Mm -hmm. very, kind of, very different from the psychedelic, right? Yeah, yeah. The more body based, right? Yeah. So, uh, I really wanted to try, but my, my, my attitude is when it's meant to happen, it will fall into place. Mm -hmm. Okay, what happened? I got invited down to Peru mm. by a group in Lima mm -hmm. who wanted me to do a workshop on psychotherapy and Buddhism and lack mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that the guy that was in charge of me, his mother, along with a French doctor, had founded a ayahuasca center mm. for the practice of ayahuasca in rural. And so he's done it many times. He, his girlfriend's done it. And it just fell into my lap. They took me to the center. And uh, so I tried it, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it uh, but it, it was tough. I, I think I was dehydrated mm -hmm. and it was so foul. It, uh, I guess both times it, 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 it was a, like a very, very deep kind of contemplative samadhi, very, very deep samadhi of the sort that like in samadhi, sometimes you see thoughts that you are identifying with that you don't know that you were identifying mm. with. It was like a very, very deep samadhi in a session. Mm. But I, I think lots of other things that people have experienced and you probably have, I didn't experience them. Mm. And, um, and I somehow got the feeling my body was telling me that that wasn't, that wasn't the way forward. Whereas mm. I might be very open to more psilocybin mm. some mm. other time. What about you guys? It was very important for you, I gather, right? It was pretty powerful, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think without that, I would have, I don't know that the door would have opened with any kind of meditation without knowing what's possible. 
Right. And man, with the uh, ayahuasca, I was like, okay, the possibility is. That's it. That's it. Wow. But Pete was fantastic, but uh, it was, it was with, within an Umbandaimi tradition. And that's interesting because it's the Umbanda, which of course is Afro-Brazilian. And so it's got the Orishas, the spirit possession. So, you know, it's a, it's a challenging first, uh, you know, and, and like to see a bunch of people dressed in white, you know, flailing around, uh, you know, yeah. engaging, engaging with spirits. It's like not the easiest first way in. And Pete was just there with the biggest smile rolling around in his vomit in the leaves, just oh, happy gosh. as can be. And yeah. uh, so much so that the, the people who, who run the ceremony, Brazilians who've been doing this for a very long time, um, were super impressed because it's not every day that someone just shows up and just kind of, you know, even though you couldn't walk very well, I mean, you just kind of, you opened up into it. Wow. It was uh, such beauty. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I had... That first experience was just beauty, pure beauty. Yeah. But I've also had where the it going down and right away I knew it was going to be tough. It was going to be really hard. So it hasn't always just been pure beauty, that's for sure. And I think I was lucky that that first one was just such a beautiful experience. Because mm -hmm. uh, if it had been, I did kind of a, more of a Peruvian style one. And I think if it had been like that, I said, mm, that was, you know, really interesting, but it didn't open the door in the right direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, is so interesting because it's so embodied, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. unlike the shamanic or even the Santo Daimi traditions, you're like running around, jumping around and mm -hmm. different. For me, that was very important that the, the Peruvian thing when I just had to sit there, I literally was contracting every muscle in my body just sitting there. It was very difficult, which, and I appreciate difficult situations. So it gave me what I needed, <laughs> but that ability to move and that really, uh, that might've made a difference for me. Yeah. Yeah. And both, both my cases, it was just sitting there. So, oh, yeah. and, you know, that that's different. Well, yeah. It's not my place to invite you to someone else's deal, but I really <laughs> think that the Umbandaime, being able to move, oh, I mean, we wow. talked about, you talked about, you know, being open to love. The ayahuasca showed me how open I could be to just re receiving love. And be, when I received it in that manner, I also was able to, to give it out in ways that I'd never thought possible i mean i was a i was radiating love out oh, and wow. absorbing it in and it was oh my gosh yeah but, but to, to answer your question david that uh, for me i think the most powerful experience was when i first started drinking it was not that long after the scar accident i was telling you about and i knew i had a lot of unresolved just energies and just things which were still causing me a lot of physical and emotional grief and so I, the first time, you know, it was a very powerful experience, but didn't even touch that. It took me six months to come back. Second time, also a very powerful experience. And it wasn't until the fifth time. And the fifth time, I was sitting there, and I felt energy in my hara, and then came up my spine mm -hmm. and went right to where the break was, which is now a big piece of metal all fused together. And a whole bunch of things happened at the same time. It was, but what, what, what I think that the, thing of it was like something just opened up and energetically that that part of me that was there even though i was unconscious when i was in the scar accident and i was always happy that like i wasn't conscious but the part of me that was you know the eye that never sleeps that was exactly there had been holding on to that moment of breaking for 13 years and it let it go and it i just felt like i was hit by lightning and so i, you know, I spent two hours there just with this release and everything just turning into this, you know, array of whatever, but uh, you know, it, it, I, I didn't leave healed, but what I did leave was whew, like something let go and I felt I had my life back. So that, that, wow. I think that's why it was powerful for me. With Umba and Daimi, and I'd, I'd be curious of your thoughts if, if you've had any clarifications on this, that there is this whole other aspect, you know, energy, I could take that since birth intellectually and uh, channels and chakras. Yeah. But uh, bodhisattvas, different beings who come into your body, engaging with different beings and nature spirits, that's a whole other 
that's a whole nother leap. And it, so kind of like Pete was saying, like, I could never have made a leap like that without being pushed off the cliff. But I'm curious as a, as a Buddhist practitioner, you know, where do those sorts of forces, beings, you know, and whether it's Odishas in the biggest sense or, you know. Sp- yeah. I, I've had experiences where I, I, I felt I was communicating with, you know, invisible, disincarnate beings that were teaching me something. Mm-hmm. Where does that fit into Buddhism? Well, yeah. I, I don't know. We could maybe talk to them to some Bodhi. But, you know, it's like that's <laughs> not it's not usually a part of Buddhism. So, you know, it, it doesn't add up. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful. It doesn't add up. I love it. Uh, Don't know mind, you know? Fantastic. Fantastic. And Sorry? It was last word and... Fan- it's fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Uh, oh, don't know mind. Uh, I, know? I thought you said, instead of fantastic, I thought you said, and custard. I was like, all right. <laughs> don't know mind and custard, I'm there. <laughs> I, I prefer ice cream, but anyway. Um, right. Yeah, so, I mean, the world is, I mean, one of the takeaways for me from Buddhism is, you know, I don't, oh, you guys just froze. Are you still there? We're hearing you, but this might be a good time to kind of uh, wrap us up so we don't uh, kick you off again. And we're done.